Austin and, and what it was and what has happened to it. East Austin was created by ordinance in 1928 through the City of Austin Master Plan. Most everybody who comes to Austin hears about that, but they don't know some of the things that happened after that. For example, Rosewood Park and Pool were built in the 1940s as the Negro Park and Pool because African Americans were not wanted <coughs> elsewhere in the city, and this was right in Central East Austin. And so a little later, then Saragossa Park and Pool were created as the Mexican Park and Pool for the same reason. So no Barton Springs for us? No, no, no Barton no. Springs. <laughs> and, and so there, there are lots and lots of examples of that, but I won't go into detail. I just mentioned those because those are pretty well known. In uh, early, about the same time as the master plan, the city of Austin started working on removing Mexican-Americans from what was then called Little Mexico, which is basically where the city hall currently sits now, and all the way up to Republic Square, which was called Chili Park, not because of the fact that it was the Mexican park, but because there was a chili uh, factory right next to it. And that's where many of the Mexican-American people worked. And it goes on. The Industrial Development Plan of 1957 led to the placement of an industrial overlay over all residential properties in East Austin. And what does that do? Why, why is that a bad thing? It would seem to be a good thing because you could sell your property for more because somebody could put an industry up, right? No. First of all, this was considered the black and brown area. Nobody was looking to buy those properties one at a time. They would buy a large plat and turn it into an industry. Secondly, what it did was it made it impossible for an owner of a home who was zoned industrial to get a loan for home improvement. And so people's homes started to deteriorate and they couldn't get the money to be able to repair them. And so along comes the city in the 1960s and says, oh, we have some slums over here. We have a blighted area. We gotta start doing something about it. So they did and it was called urban renewal. <laughs> People in East Austin have always referred to it as urban removal because that's what it did. It removed people of color from the homes that they had, however modest, however deteriorated because they couldn't get loans, and some very perfectly nice ones were, were removed as well. Um, when Gilbert and I, my husband and I, were working on our book on Rosewood neighborhood, we found some interviews that had been done with people at the time who were offered like a thousand dollars for their home and their home had an appraisal of five thousand dollars on it. It's the same thing's happening today. Jump forward to 2017. We now have a situation where neighborhoods that have been in existence for over 75 years where nobody in their right minds wanted to live, nobody white, powerful, let me phrase it that way. Nobody wanted to live in East Austin. In fact, people would say to us, why on earth do you live there? You could afford to live somewhere else. <laughs> My husband's boss at Austin Energy once asked him, why is it that you live in East Austin? Don't you get tired of the gunshots? No. Never heard any. And, <laughs> and that very same gentleman complained to Gilbert once about the fact that every time he goes out to mow his yard in Circle C, on his riding mower, at least one neighbor will drive up and say, how much do you charge for the yard work anyhow? Assuming a Mexicano could not live out there. So my point in trying to run through that very quickly is that it's still happening. What's happening is poor people of color are being displaced because rich people in power can do it and it's not an accident. They will say, it's market forces, it's market forces. Okay, if it were exclusively market forces, why is it that this thing didn't start in 2000? It didn't start until the city opened up 6th Street as a corridor for redevelopment. So if 2000, there was a demand for housing, why did it wait for the city to open something up? It's because there was this silent agreement. Everybody knew, all the developers in town knew East Austin isn't for you. This is not where you need to be developing. You can't make any money over there. It's not a place to go. How does Code Next fit into this? 
Code Next is the law that is based on Imagine Austin. Many of us call it Imagine Austin without poor people. Because if you look at the city's master plan, unlike the 1928 master plan, there is no place for poor people in the new plan. You don't see trailer parks. You don't see places where mobile homes or manufactured homes are allowed. You do see tiny lots, but you don't see them for tiny homes for families. You see them for individuals who are moving in, just starting their careers in the tech industry. And so, on the task force, what did we say we wanted to see? First of all, we wanted to see a dedicated fund. The legislature stopped us in the bud of doing a linkage fee, but there are other things that we can do. For example, the city of Denver set up a special entity that raises private funds as well as public funds, and those funds are dedicated solely to helping people who were displaced from their former homes in central Denver. The mayor was working on a strike fund where he would get from corporations and individuals money to purchase at market rate deteriorated multifamily housing, renovate it, and rent it back out through private nonprofits. Jane? Yes. Can, can I just um, ask you some of the solutions that you have? Can we hold those sure. until the end? Sure. Because those are really good solutions, and we would really like to <coughs> kind of wrap it up with that and make sure that we we carve out a special time to talk about solutions. Is, right. that, is that good? That would be good. Mm -hmm. So let me summarize or finalize my, my first input as saying that don't think that displacement is happening accidentally. Displacement has happened periodically, historically, throughout Austin's history. It's not an accident. And if it's not an accident, then we have to take specific targeted actions to stop it. Thank you. and that history, I learned so much and I'm just learning more and more every time I interact with folks like you, so I appreciate that. Um, and in a minute, we're gonna take some questions, um, but before we do that, I would like to introduce someone else I met today that I had hoped I would meet at some point um, because she's quite an impressive um, person as well and a uh, strong woman. And I know her father, uh, Daniel Yanez, um, Daniel Yanez, actually, um, my partner in crime, I might add. But anyway, we'll just not say that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, he, he's like maybe from one generation of activists. And when I told Carmen when I met her today, I said, oh my gosh, another generation of activists. Isn't that wonderful? So Carmen Yanez Polito? Yes. And she also has the topic of Code Next in the historical context rooted in intergenerational relationships. And Carmen was born and raised in Austin on both sides of the highway. I guess that means east and west. And she told me some of her mentors were some of the very people that I knew, um, I don't know, back when I came to Austin in the uh, mid-1980s, uh, people like Marcus de Leon, um, Paul Hernandez, uh, Hortensia Palomares, and uh, Susana um, as well. So uh, she has organized with communities around public health issues and root causes of disparities for the last 14 years. She studied environmental policy and free trade at the University of Chicago. So I did say she was pretty impressive, and that's very impressive right there. She's the executive director of Go Austin, Vamos Austin, or GABA, and currently serves as vice chair of the city's Hispanic Latino Quality of Life Commission. So I'm going to turn it over to Carmen, and let, we'll hear from her. Thank you so much, and um, I'll second the accolades to uh, to Ms. Phillips, especially because we know there have been some rocky moments for the statesman lately, and um, <laughs> we're waiting for we're waiting for what's the reaction to our reaction going to be, and um, yeah. and so when you speak, it's a relief. Um, I, I just also want to um, repeat that I, I'm I'm very honored to be sitting on this panel alongside a really esteemed group of panelists, super knowledgeable people who I've learned from um, each and every one of you, and of course, 
um, Susanna being one of my greatest uh, organizing mentors. Um, so I feel very privileged to be here. Um, and I, I, the reason I was interested, I was asked to give a five to eight word summary. And so um, that was my you know, historical context, um, intergenerational relationships. I, I believe that intergenerational organizing is one of the most powerful tools for, for social change that we have. Um, and what I see often in this very polarizing debate about Code Next and about housing and displacement is I see some folks out there who are, um, who have the consternation, who have the passion, who wanna change things. And sometimes I see folks who appear to me what I would describe, and I say this without judgment, but untethered, untethered to a grounding a history here in Austin or to the communities who have been here and who have seen things. Um, I, I, was, I participated in a health equity training recently where, um, where one of the trainers talked about the collective amnesia that the United States has about our history, in particular our foreign policy history, but even domestically our history of institutionalized racism and segregation and oppression. And, uh, and somehow we forget, right? But we know it's also not unintentional. We've had, um, we've had education that has, has erased some of our history from our educational system. And here in Austin, I feel like that amnesia is almost more compounded because I still consider myself a young person and I find myself having to remind people in these public debates, even, if, even in AISD, what's happening with LASA and LBJ. I'm a graduate of LBJ High School. And the way that people talk about the academy and the formation, there's things that happened 10 years ago that people are forgetting about that are really key. So I think it's incredibly important for us to have elders in our conversations, um, as well as young people. We need that intergenerational connection because otherwise we lose track of how we got here. And if we don't keep track of how we got here, then we will be completely lost in finding the solutions, especially with this 1100 page document that is so convoluted and full of jargon that even master architects are having a hard time deciphering it. So uh, I'll say till we get to solutions for what I think we should do about that. But I wanted to talk really quickly since my profession is in public health now um, and I, I do a lot of work around health. Um, we have a very successful initiative in South and Southeast Austin, started in Dove Springs, expanded to the adjacent zip code 78745 right here south of Ben White. Um, from, from the east side all the way to Brody uh, called Go Austin, Vamos Austin. We've engaged about 1,600 residents over the last five years in improving access to healthy food and physical activity and truly making these neighborhoods uh, healthier places to live so that the children are not, um, basically their, their futures of health is not predetermined in a negative way by their zip code. And now we have this issue of displacement rearing its ugly head in our faces. We've known, we've done work to organize people so that they could take, uh, they could take on any issue coming in front of them, but we took a position on Code Next last year. We decided to have a platform called Salud y Permanencia, Health and Permanence, that we want healthy communities and, and communities don't deserve to be displaced just because they finally get the amenities that they've been missing for decades. Um, and and a, what really, something that really drove this home for me, especially thinking about what I've seen in, in my old neighborhood in East Austin, in Old West Austin where I was born, which was a very eclectic and diverse place when I was growing up, is that we lose something beyond just our, our overall, uh, well what I should say is our social support is so much bigger than just our social lives. There are health outcomes and health impacts associated with displacement. And one of the things that really drove this home for me, I was listening to the radio and I heard a story about the babushka studies in Chernobyl. Is anybody familiar with those? Basically, there's a subset of older women, grandmothers, babushkas, in the Chernobyl areas that were <coughs> evacuated. And most of those areas are desolate, the places with the highest radiation, uh, they haven't wanted people to live there. But there's a subset of older women who stayed despite everyone else leaving. And they actually have better health outcomes than many of the communities that were relocated to places with lower radiation levels. The only thing that, that, that the researchers can actually gather is the reason for this is that their social support has kept them in better health because they have a routine, they have strong relationships, they check in on each other, they take care of each other. So what happens when we lose that social cohesion? And I think about this because we've seen it in the black community so much in East Austin. We've seen it in the Chicano community for sure, and we have a replenishment of immigrants that come and 
keep us rooted to our culture and have grown our overall general population, but we're not a monolith. We've lost a lot of the, those intergenerational connections that keep us healthy, keep us strong, and keep us grounded. You can't put a price on that. I'm sure you can, actually. If we studied it enough, we could really show what it's costing us in terms of these health impacts, but it's really an important piece of it. So um, the, the, the other thing I want to say really quickly is that this has been a very polarizing debate around Code Next, and especially urbanists versus central neighborhoods. And I want to say a few things, especially to some of the new urbanists out there, that neighborhood associations are not a monolith. Homeowners are not a monolith. Renters are not a monolith. And neither are low-income people and people of color. There are a lot of communities of color, historic communities in this city, that built community and culture in single-family homes. Look at Blackland. Look at Go Valley Johnson. Look at Holly and what's happened to Holly. Yeah. Look at all the neighborhoods in the Eastern Crescent. And I can tell you right now in Dove Springs, there's a lot of people hanging on to their homes who have fought. There, are, there were 300 families that were displaced by the Halloween floods in 2013 and 2015. There are people who fought to gain home equity for upward mobility, for stability in their families, who lost it or are on the verge of losing it. So when we demonize single family homes, when we talk about single family homes as, a, as an element of racism for some reason, that dialogue, that, that narrative erases homeowners of color, it erases people of color who are working toward home ownership, and yes, there are renters in neighborhood associations, some might be surprised. I also would like to add that a lot of the new folks coming in who are renting in East Austin are coming in with much higher incomes than their white counterparts in Central Austin neighborhoods who bought a house 30, 40 years ago on a modest middle class income. So those Central Austin neighborhoods are absolutely feeling pressure that East Austin has disproportionately felt for a long time, and the East Austin folks had systemic oppression not on their side, right? So it's not an even playing field, and there is a lot more density coming into East Austin. But we need to be very careful, I think, about who we, who we point the finger at in terms of the cause of these issues. We're talking about a growth machine in Austin that has been insatiable for a long time. And I don't necessarily think that weakening neighborhood associations' abilities west of I-35 is gonna satiate that growth machine enough to stop it from consuming East Austin. So we need to talk about family culture. We need to talk about history and all of these in these conversations. And you know, there are neighborhood associations that want more density in their neighborhoods. There are some folks in South Austin who would like some more density. They want it on their terms. And so I think what's really important here is process over content. We need to look at the, the process in, by which neighborhoods, not just neighborhood associations and planned areas, although there are some in East Austin, let's not forget, um, that everyone has the ability to participate and give meaningful input and shape the future of their neighborhoods. The process is important because it's not going to look the same all over. Um, so um, I'm very grateful to everyone here for bringing their history and for everyone in the audience. I know there's a lot of folks here who have their own, their own stories and their own knowledge to bring to the table and we really need everybody in this. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is, is go to the audience and um, you can... ...while leaving Austin's neighborhoods of color flooding Un with unsafe streets, inadequate access to healthy foods, inadequate school funding, substandard housing, and ultimately gentrification. The 13th Amendment adopted immediately after the Civil War prohibited slavery or in general treating African Americans as second class citizens, while the 14th Amendment prohibited states or their local governments from treating people unfairly or unequally. From the 1870s until the 1920s, blacks, blacks and Mexicans were forced to move into settlements out that were outside of Austin at that time, into Clarksville, St. John's, and Manitoulis. In 1922, Congress passed the Standard State Enabling Act. That act gave all the municipalities throughout the United States to start to segregate their cities. And in 1928, the city of Austin, of course, did its master plan, which we call Yes Master. 
because in that time they began to relocate African Americans living in Wheatsville and Clarksville, known as Freedman Towns, dating back to the 1870s in West Austin. Since Austin knew it could not use zoning because it would be challenged constitutionally, they began to work on other policies. And what they began to do in that area was making sure that the segregated schools, parks, and libraries were closed down. And then they developed new schools, new libraries, and the first African-American uh, black housing, Rosewood Courts in East Austin, to help in the forced uh, relocation of communities of color. And from the 1870s to the 1940s, Mexican-American families were concentrated in neighborhoods southwest and downtown and remained downtown through the 1940s. Uh, the completion of the Tom uh, Miller Dam and the Longhorn Dam uh, protected the city from major floods. Thus began the <coughs> land increase of value of price downtown and also the relocation of the Mexican-American community to the segregated side of town in East Austin. Other policies such as deed restrictions and city ordinance prohibit both Mexican and African Americans from buying and renting homes anywhere outside of East Austin. In 1957, the Industrial Development Plan allowed the Planning Commission to zone all property in East Austin industrial, including single family residential homes. Under cumulative zoning, residence home could be built and land zone industrial. Cumulative zoning allowed um, polluting facilities and other hazardous facilities to be located in, our, in the East Austin next to homes and schools. Uh, but West Austin was protected from cumulative zoning. In 1956, the Highway Act was used to segregate and displace communities of color throughout the entire United States. In Austin, Highway 35 created the clearest physical barrier between East Austin and the rest of the city, deepening the racial segregation. Mopac, another highway, was used to displace the remaining African Americans in West Austin. Another gentrification tool used in the 1960s to 1970s was the urban renewal program known as urban removal by communities of color. The city of Austin instituted this program and used eminent domain to steal the land from people of color in East Austin. They actually did use eminent domain, and you can just go down the 11th and 12th Street and see what's there now. The East Cesar Chavez Neighborhood Plan located uh, east of Highway 35 was adopted in May of 1999. This plan opened the floodgates to gentrification throughout East Austin. Residents in the area have experienced a rapid escalation of praised property values. According to a UT study, area residents and the single family homes experienced over a 400% plus increase in land values and a 120% <coughs> increase in property taxes. And that was just from the period of 1998 to 2004. So you can imagine what it is today. The Austin City Council adopted the East Riverside Corridor Master Plan in 2010 and adopted the new design zoning regulations in 2013. The council adopted the plan as if Riverside Drive was vacant of human life. Over 1,700 low-income working poor, mostly people of color, were displaced to make room for the new higher density, higher class wage earners. There is so much Pedro will be um, handing out. We have for their created a whole timeline on gentrification um, that you all can see. But we must work together to implement land development code that is fair and just, that eliminates institutional barriers to equity, and there, that repairs the displacement and disruptions of Austin's communities of color. Thank you. To know and respect over the years as one of the uh, intellectuals at University of Texas, and it w he has come in and filled a void in this community to talk about issues of color and race and how they they form and shape 
policies and communities and given us trends and things that we could actually, real-time data that we could latch on to. And I'm talking about Dr. Eric Tang, and he's going to talk about the tools to prevent displacement in Austin. Dr. Tang is an associate professor of black studies at UT Austin and faculty director of UT's Community Engage Engagement Center. And he's also my homeboy from New York, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> His current research focuses on the past and present of racial segregation in Austin, Texas, paying particular attention to the gentrification-driven displacements of the city's long-standing African-American residents. He served as co-chair of the Housing and Real Estate Committee of the Mayor's Task Force on Institutional Racism this year. Dr. Tang? Thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Good afternoon. Yes. So um, I'm a relative newcomer to Austin. I got here in 2009. And I'll begin by saying that my research and my analysis on Austin is informed by my outsider status. I don't know exactly when one becomes an Austinite. You guys can tell me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I consider myself a New Yorker. I was born in Queens, went to college in Manhattan, was a community organizer in the Bronx, went to Brooklyn to write my dissertation and have my first kid. So logically, the next step for me would be to move to Austin. Because <laughs> everyone and their mother has moved to Austin, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And when I got here, I was asked by the University of Texas to help start up their community engagement center because I had spent a decade as a community organizer prior to becoming a professor. And they thought that background would be useful to them as, I, as they started this community engagement center. And while you know, I agreed to it, I started working on 11th Street, um, I began to hear anecdotally from African American community leaders in all sectors, housing, the arts, that um, black folks were literally vanishing from the east side. In fact, this one group that um, used to do the black arts movement festival every year called Pro Arts had this great t-shirt uh, that said, Pro Arts, we know where all the black people are. <laughs> um, and it, it was funny, but it's all, it, it, would be, um, it would be even funnier if it wasn't so sad because it was true, right? And so the joke soured a bit when I decided to look into these numbers and find out what exactly is the rate of black displacement from Austin. And so what we did on a hunch was we compared Austin as a fast growing city to its peer cities. By, by that I mean we compared Austin to, to other cities that were over half a million people and that experienced at least 10% general population growth between the years 2000 and 2010. Okay, there are about 15 cities that fit that criteria. And of those 15 cities, every single other city saw a simultaneous increase in African Americans except for one, and that was Austin. So let me be really clear here. When cities grow at the rate that Austin does, which is 20.4% between 2000 and 2010, they shouldn't see losses in any major racial group. We're not saying that those groups like African Americans and Latinos will grow at the same rate as the general population, but they need to see some positive growth, right? Maybe it's 15%, maybe it's 10%. Black population growth wasn't growth at all. It was a negative, an absolute numerical decline of negative 5.4%. That just doesn't happen. That, is, that makes Austin a statistical outlier. Does that make sense, what we're saying? Like you don't see losses against growth, okay? And I could hardly believe it when we ran the census data, so I asked my team to run it multiple times, and they were like, no, this is absolutely true. This is where, this is how astounding the statistic was that I was even surprised by how, how severe it was. So how do we explain this? We explain this by looking at history and how history converges with the present. So as my co-panelists have already mentioned, in 1928, the city of Boston designated an area that it called the Negro District to deal with the so-called segregation problem. It not, wasn't like, as if, you know, it was like a utility issue, right? Um, to deal with 
how they were going to implement white supremacist rule, which is how they should have written it, but they called it the segregation <laughs> problem. And they carved out this area, and as my co-panelists uh, mentioned, they compelled African American <coughs> families who previous to 1928 had lived in various communities all over central Austin to move to this one area. By the mid-1930s, about 80% of, Afri of the African Americans in Austin were pushed to this area. And this area just sits east of um, you know, what is today I-35, the gateway being 11th Street, Franklin Barbecue, that's the gateway. Well, the people who designed the 1928 master plan likely never envisioned that this, that one day this area would be coveted land for new professional class and, and new businesses. They never predicted that it would be the site, the prime site of gentrification. So when you push one population in a concentrated way in one area, and then that same area becomes what? the prime site of gentrification, it's going to lead to the rapid displacement of that one racial group. So the reason why you see this outlier status with respect to Austin and African Americans is because of the convergence of historical segregation and what we might call neoliberal gentrification. African Americans who can no longer afford to pay the taxes in those neighborhoods or who just didn't feel it's worth it to hold on upon moving, looked around the rest of Austin and saw that, well, housing everywhere else within the city limits is also not affordable. And so many of them moved outside the city limits. Again, this explains Austin's outlier status, okay? So after doing our initial study, and at any point, brother, cut, cut me off, because I'm not keeping time for how long I'm going, but, okay. Um, we decided to ask the residents who had left and gone outside of the city limits, well, why did you leave? You know, what we do as academics sometimes is we prove out the obvious. <laughs> because people challenge us. They do. They say, well, how do you know that these yeah. folks who moved didn't move to these nice bedroom communities out in, you know, um, north of Austin? And, uh, and it was a move up in reminiscent of white flights of the suburbs during like the 1950s and 60s. OK, we said, well, why don't we ask them? Why don't we ask them? And we had the opportunity to ask them because many of them come back to East Austin on Sundays for church. Yep. And so what we did is we set up outside of churches and we asked people, do you fit this criteria? You have moved out of Austin um, sometime between um, sometime between now and like the, 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 uh, the, the 1990, 1999 when they did the census. And by and large, the people who we surveyed who fit that criteria said they moved out because housing was simply unaffordable. That was a single, you know, the single number one reason. The second reason, interestingly enough, was they felt that the Austin schools were far too segregated. Mm -hmm. And they just implicitly knew that the more segregated a school is, the worse off their kids are gonna be. And they saw that the schools in Pflugerville and Round Rock, Rock, Round Rock were more integrated, even out in Elgin and, and Maynard, they were more integrated. And they said, my kid's gonna get a better shot in a more integrated school. That was the second leading reason. But since we're talking about housing, let me stick to that. Affordability was the main issue. And then we asked them, if you had it your way, would you return to Austin? And they said, yeah, if housing was affordable. Again, we as academics, we prove out the obvious. And so we have both quantitative and qualitative data to show that this placement was driven by lack of affordability, by gentrification, and that if affordable housing were built and accessible in Austin, people would move back. So that's what we know. Now in terms of action steps that were in the report, should I hold off on that, Alberta? Yeah, we can okay. hold off on that. All right, well thank you, and I'll talk more about action steps. Yeah. In America is, you know, 11 to 1. Yeah. So it's not that it's true. Yeah. So there is a lot of things that have happened, and we'll get into more about discussion, including the University of Texas's role in um, displacing black land, of all places, uh, very older people who were homeowners, but um, one story I covered. So um, now I'm going to introduce um, really one of the smartest people on the planet that I know, and especially in the area of public housing. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Dr. McGee. <laughs> And um, any time that I need something, like when I first started covering the Rosewood uh, courts 
And I'm like, oh yeah, they want to redevelop it. They want to make it nicer for us people of color. Oh yeah. So he had to sit me down and swear me and, and tell me what was really going on. And I go, oh, okay. The lights came on. And Dr. McGee has been doing this for a very long time, and he does it so eloquently. He is an urban and environmental anthropologist who has written about and organized extensively in public housing projects in Europe, America, and the Pacific Islands. As the last Mike Hogg Fellow at UT Austin, he helped to create the university's undergraduate degree program in urban studies, as well as the doctoral portfolio. An adjunct associate professor of anthropology at Austin Community College, Dr. McGee currently serves on Austin's Community Development Commission and the Joint Sustainability Committee and has been active in the private sector as a consultant archaeologist and historian since 2002. And I want to say that one of the things that I witnessed this year with Dr. McGee was he, him getting a uh, Austin NAACP award, he and Susanna Alamanza, for the, for the incredible work that they have done. On the my military voice unless I have to. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's uh, an honor to be here. And I'll try to be brief. I'll try to use my status as the last panelist to just raise a couple of questions so that we can get into the dialogue as quick as possible. Before I do that, I just want to shout out my little Bernie doll. Okay? <laughs> uh, those of you know that Bernie spoke here when he first came here um, three years ago. And I'd like to shout out all the white men on the wall over there, you know. <laughs> uh, let's do something about that, Union. Uh, now, I'm going to hold up a document. And this document is Imagine Austin. Uh -huh. Who here has read this document? You need to read this document. Why? Because Code Next supposedly implements Imagine Austin. Yes. Some of y'all might have people next door to you doing things that you really would not like to have next door, and there's nothing you can do about it. You won't get notified, and you can complain, and still nothing will happen. So that's one thing. Another is ensure that any projects that receive city funding don't offer exclusively market rate housing. And in fact, there are lots of ways, and people who serve on this uh, Community Development Commission can tell in detail, but I won't. There are ways to get around it so that you can have your max, the amount that you can demand as the city under the current rules of a developer is 10% of all of their units. So if they're doing 100, that means 10 have to be affordable. Affordable is 60% of median family income, and that's high here in the city of Austin. They do not have to have multiple bedrooms. They can be efficiencies. And so you might, out of 10 units, get one appropriately sized for a family. And that's, that's a concern. And then um, we encourage that the Code Next include modular manufactured mobile and tiny homes as affordable to workforce families because the affordable housing is what's being torn down and being replaced by unaffordable housing. So we have to replace some of that affordable housing that's being lost. And finally, ensure that no one funding model such as density bonuses, be recommended in Code Next. Right now, Code Next is just chock full of density bonus here, here, there, and everywhere. And we recommended that that's not appropriate, that you know, you're just perpetuating that one funding model for alleged uh, affordable housing. I just want to give a, um, a fact here that under the Code Next plan, density bonuses will quadruple. Yes. And they will quadruple without any policy to determine who should be served by the density bonuses. So that's something. The idea uh, behind code next zoning, as I have come to understand it, is that density equals affordability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you ask for the definition of affordability, what I've been told is that, so you, for example, in the Bolden Creek neighborhood, you might you're going to build on the trans, transit sector of that neighborhood, so on the perimeter where the uh, public transportation can come by. 
So affordability as defined by the makers of code next equals tearing down a home that somebody bought when they were like upper or middle class and replacing it with a, uh, a fourplex. And so you will have four uh, condos or apartments in that fourplex that each go from for about $550,000 to $800,000, as opposed to a single family home that might have to be sold for a million. And I'm going, that's not my idea of affordability. Mm -hmm. So the density question behind this premise needs to be challenged. Dr. Payne. So I've been looking at the uh, density bonus mm -hmm. issue as well lately, and I'm not convinced that it's going to make a dent in affordability. Um, and that simply has to do with the fact that there is very little to suggest that developers can be held accountable to the promises that they make. Um, and it's also to suggest that the market can't correct the affordability crisis that they created it to begin with. So, um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I actually don't want to be distracted by code next, even though it's been event, right? Um, or I don't want to be led on a fool's errand. Um, and I'll say that I'd rather talk about what I want and what I think makes sense. If we know for certain, historically, that the city of Austin engineered racial segregation and hence economic segregation and inequality, yes. then we have to draw the logical conclusion that it needs to redress that problem. And redress is not um, just an apology. An apology is important, and I think that's still belated. But redress comes in the form of reparation, or as um, one of our audience members just shouted out, money cold hard cash, a fund. You need to quantify redress. And so what we put in this report was to begin a dedicated fund to build affordable housing and to maintain existing affordable housing. We threw in the linkage fee as one main strategy, knowing full well that it was up for political debate can call it that at the state <laughs> legislature. But the linkage fee was not the only revenue stream mm -hmm. for this dedicated fund. And here I have to ask a question for um, Austinites who've been here much longer than I have, which is why didn't the city get cash for land that it owned in the Mueller development? Yes. And why didn't it get cash for the land that it owned at, at, at sea holding right now. What happened? I mean, it's an honest question, and it's not like, I don't, I'm not interested in Mia Culpa's, I'm, I'm, it's an honest question from somebody who's a relative outsider. What happened that developers got that land with the promise that they would do something good with it? Who negotiated that deal and was there opposition? Because we could have taken that money and leveraged it to actually build affordable housing to make a dent in the 48,000 units that we need below 50% MFI. And it's a, this isn't a rhetorical question, this is an honest question. Does anyone know? Because I can't seem to figure that out. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell so me about the money. The developers buy the politicians. Yeah, the developers yeah. Yeah. It's special interest. Okay. The city was out box, got ripped off in the deal. No, they were no. they were sleeping together. No. They didn't no. get out of the box. No. <laughs> but the mayor of Austin was a real estate developer. Yeah. 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 Okay. That that pretty much sums it up. But then what about the political opposition? I mean let's because let's because look we have to be fair here too. We're the choir, right? Yeah. Today. What you know, like what happened? Did we lose? Because if we lost, that's okay. Yeah. We're not yeah, losing away. Yes, but then it's the belief in the market system. Yes. I don't yes. think it was the market system so much. There, there, there were other things going on, especially with the Sehome um, deal. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't be on my <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can be. Yeah. Okay, so let me. Okay, it's here we not go. as simple as the no, it mayor isn't. was a real estate. Uh, well, well, it isn't. As, it isn't. It's a historical enough. question, and Eric will will know this. And I mentioned this in my debate that I had. Um, and I'm going to name a name here because he really is our local version of Bill Clinton, and that's Kirk Watson. Yeah. Um, in the late 1990s, um, Kirk Watson, who had a foothold in the environmental movement as well as with the Chamber of Commerce was elected mayor mm -hmm. and he embraced something at the time that was big in planning circles called smart growth yeah. Yeah. okay everybody here I think a lot of I see a lot of people nodding here that was the smart growth era of Austin <coughs> now to, make, to condense a very long story he said that we would have development in Austin because cities must always grow that's just understood uh, we must grow our tax base but we were going to make the basis for that growth what he termed a three-legged stool. The first leg of the stool was going to be prosperity. We must grow. Just that's the way it is. Capitalism. The second one was going to be, but we can grow smartly, sustainability. So that meant Austin Energy got resources. It's green building program, the oldest in the country, got additional people, et cetera. And that was going to be the mechanism to a large extent that was going to be used to drive our real estate industry because around that time we also declared East Austin a desired development zone. Yeah. And that was in direct contradiction with what was the third leg of the three-legged stool at the time that quickly became forgotten, which was equity. Okay, now when Mayor Wynn came in, over time, around the time of Lance Armstrong, and I argue that what happened to Austin's real estate sector was just like Lance Armstrong's steroids. We put our real estate sector on steroids and cheated our way and screwed over a lot of people. The equity piece just fell by the wayside. Right around the time that you're talking about, it was actually formally removed by the city council to where you didn't even hear the city council anymore talking about equity anymore because the presumption was, and because Richard Florida said so, because we have so many creative class people in our city, that we don't even have to worry about that. The market was actually going to correct this problem yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. And well, it didn't. Okay. So you're right, I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. And that's, I agree with what Jeff said as well. We, over time, and it was a gradual process, got to a place where we believed that it was actually good for poor people to give rich people more money. Mm -hmm. oh, I just wanted to add on the recommendations that we've been working on with a lot of the communities of color and our um, white allies is that we have to acknowledge the history, uh, the racist history in the land development code before we can move forward. And the other thing that we need to delay the adoption of the land development code changes until it goes through an equ uh, equity racial lens. Yes. We, can, we should not move forward until we do that. And we need to prioritize the voices of communities that have been most negatively impacted by historic land use practices in Austin as changes to the code are considered. And we must preserve and expand the existing public participation process for implementing zoning and uh, land development code and articulate our commitment to implement the land development code that is fair and just and that eliminates institutional barriers to equity and tying changes to the land development code solutions to Austin's affordability crisis to policies that prevent displacement, provide reparations, and relocation for people of color and other vulnerable communities, and preserve existing, expand construction of affordable homes for the working poor and the families. So we need to make sure that the policies that are going to address the affordability that are going to stop the gentrification and mitigate the gentrification <coughs> and all the public participation <coughs> process is in place first before we go into code next. I keep hearing, well, let's do code next and then we'll address those issues. No, that's not the way it works. That's how we become this historic institutional racism, land use planning <coughs> code, because we always say we'll do that later. If we want to change the paradigm that has happened, if we want to bring the African American population, if we want to bring families back into the city, we need to address those policies first before we go on to code next, because if not, I know communities of color will be next out of Austin. We're almost there. We're holding on just by our fingernails. 
And it's gonna take everybody to do that work. And I can tell you, that mayor, he's a smart cookie. <laughs> and he whispers about everything, you know? And so, he's also the whisperer. So you have to be watching because you can really get mesmerized there for a while. Because he keeps saying, well, the code is broken. And that's why we need him to sign up. We need to get going with the landing code because it's broken and that's how we're gonna fix things. And so be really careful about what you hear because, you know, what we have always said in our indigenous ways, people have a way to speak with four tongues. They say one thing and they do the other. And so we have to be really careful and stay on top of it. So, so. I'm just gonna add one more thing to what Fred said because it, it is part of what he said. So, he talked about Watson's three-legged stool, but also there's another element to that because it was more secretive than that. The environmentalist community and the SOS uh, movement, uh, part of that deal that was cut was to stop growth over the aquifer, over environmentally sensitive areas, and that they won a huge victory with that. And so the smart growth was actually steered toward and targeted East Austin. And so folks went into a room and cut a deal, and the people who didn't know anything about the deal were folks of color. We did not know that East Austin was then going to become an extension of downtown. Yeah. Dr. Tang. So, so the punchline to my question slash comment is this, that you engage in density bonuses of this sort when you don't have any way to capitalize your own projects, but when you're sitting on that much potential capital, it doesn't make sense to me that you would do that. Yeah. I mean, you could have just taken that and leveraged it. Right. And that's, you know, and I'm, and I'm, no, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know, and I'm no real estate developer or money manager, but it, it is like part, is it pathological? I don't know. Um, it is. It is. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, let me, let me, let me, let me not go on that tangent. I, I just, this, that's, my, that's, that's my point, right? And so here's where, here, going, going to what I was saying at the outset around not getting dragged into a false debate or right. sent on a fool's errand. I think what we need to do is to assert the common sense plan that if you fund it and build it, it will do more for affordable housing than if you do these other kind of incentivized things. And, 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 and I think what we need to do is just move forward with that idea and that plan, and then in five or ten years we can test it against these density bonuses and see what did more for whom. So let's just keep it at the level of like, you know, a comparative study. Right. Okay? Right you want to do density bonuses? Right. All right. It seems like that's kind of a foregone conclusion at this point. Sure. I don't need to mm -hmm. debate it. I don't need I don't to know. go through all, all of that, as, as, as interesting no, as it, it's as it's it not not seems, not given how dog-eared Fred's um, copy of Imagine Austin. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that, that, ideas. that, that <laughs> those ideas are, 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 you know, are here to stay. Unfortunately, you know, I'm not... Oh, let me not, let me not get on that. Those those ideas are here to stay. So why don't we move ahead with the idea that we could also build right. affordable housing based on you know it being capitalized and see what happens over the course of several years and study it and analyze it. Okay. Seems fair to me. Thanks. I just want to chime in. Um, I, I will. It's like the density bonus thing is the vampire of this uh, <laughs> panel. I'm going to bring it back up just to just to highlight something because I actually do think the density bonus. Um, model can be detrimental. It's not just not helping, it's actually driving up land costs in the places where really high density developments are being put. And I'll just say, right here and now, there are three zoning cases in Go Valley Johnston Terrace neighborhood planning area, that's everything east of Pleasant Valley, right from 183 to the river, that are humongous condominium developments. One is over 100 units, you know how many Family friendly, as in three bedroom apartments, are going to be made available or condos. Four. Or even two bedrooms. And the, and the, this is going to satisfy the, their portion of that 10% at 80 80 percent MFI or below. So you've got four units in 100 plus market rate units, 
and you will inherently drive up the land value around all of those people because of how many luxury units you're putting in. So this is happening in real time. We haven't addressed that issue. Obviously, Code Next isn't going to solve all of our problems. We have a lot of stuff we have to address right now. But I think, uh, again, it's about the process. It's about the self-determination of neighborhoods to actually engage with developers and with the city um, and to know that planning staff are not going to basically be legislating through their actions and exclusion in the process. So I think a, a, big, a, a big argument that I think we can make around Code Next um, in challenging this idea that density will bring affordability, because we know it's, there's a lot to actually poke holes in that, is this that until we have the policies that will protect not just affordable housing, but low income housing, right? Low to moderate income housing, then we shouldn't be giving additional entitlements for, for density. Until we can use something like linkage fees, we don't have inclusionary zoning in the state of Texas. Austin is very much going to get challenged at a state level for a lot of the things that we try to do to regulate the market. But I think that if we were able to join together in stronger coalitions with some people who right now are treating each other like opponents, we might be able to push for things at the state level that would give us more leverage before we throw fuel on the fire that's already um, you know, accelerating the displacement. And I just want to say something that um, was wrapped up really nicely for me and has been ringing in my head a lot since I heard it from somebody in the audience who currently chairs the Environmental Commission. Somebody took that out of it. But she put it really well when she said, because, you know, I, she brings the environmental justice lens a lot on that commission. And, and when we talk about this, that historical perspective, you know, 40 years ago, Austin decided it was going to be an environmental city. And that didn't apply equally to all. We had to have an entire environmental justice movement to get that equity to the east side. But the city since then has spent millions and millions of dollars buying out land, suing over, you know, engaging in lawsuits to protect environmental preservation initiatives. And so can we as a city collectively come together and say we are going to be a city for equity, we are going to do something about the displacement problem? It's really just a question of political will. And I think that's exactly what um, Dr. Tang's talking about, is like what is it, why are they, what is it gonna take? It's gonna take all of us really forcing the hands of, of those who are representing us and saying this is too egregious an issue, we're tired of people just shrugging and saying like well, what can you do? It's so sad until it happens to them, right? <laughs> and then it's like, oh no, gentrification. But we we've got it. We've got to actually stand together and say it's not okay just to keep pushing people further and further outside. Um, but we need policies to truly mitigate this issue and, and be proactive. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt right here. Very high MFI, so you really don't uh, you know it's not hard to qualify. Uh, and the response was, well, families just want to live in the suburbs anyway. And the other thing that was said uh, was that this individual was using his white male privilege to advocate for the poor and people of color. And that kind of goes back to, well, I, I know better than, you know, we know better than, than these people do, and we're helping. So in, when you see these social justice narratives co-opted, and anyone who is, uh, who takes issue or challenges uh, these statements uh, is told that, well, you're just, a, you're exclusionary or you're a racist, or you're this or that. You know, they've, they've kind of adopted these arguments, and it, it really shuts people down. Um, so what, what, what is your thought on that? It, it's actually kind of, it's just odd that they've kind of adopted the very arguments that they themselves embody, you know, uh, in reaction. So what are your thoughts there? I can go for the first one. Okay, well, I can, I can talk about that extensively. But not extensive. But I, but I won't. I won't. But I won't. Uh, I mean, anybody who's worked in public housing over the past 20 years knows how Clinton neoliberalism was used to destroy public housing projects from coast to coast. Okay? The privatization and marketization of public housing is the perfect embodiment of the phenomenon you described. The National Low Income Housing Coalition and its Texas based affiliate now are anti public housing. They will not support and have not supported my organization, Preserve Roseway, because they think it is good for public housing residents for that housing project, which is historic, to be destroyed, its residents displaced, okay, and for something new, quote unquote, and better to be built there. Uh, there's a book I'll recommend for you called Driven from New Orleans by Jay Arena, well, John Arena, 
uh, which talks about what happened in New Orleans with the destruction of St. Thomas, Iberville, and Lafitte housing projects in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, where an avalanche of urban planners from Boston and San Francisco invaded New Orleans, privatized the public housing, privatized the public schools, and I'll leave it there, but trust me, it's not a pretty picture. And I just wanted to add briefly, there was a statement, uh, some that used to be decades ago in the, in the neighborhood, in the barrio, was poverty pimps. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that term is still very real to us. We have a lot of nonprofits who are building so-called affordable housing. I don't believe the 60% median family income is affordable when we left at 20 to 30% median family income. And I think the whole issue of being a family-based culture is being erased from the city of Austin. And so uh, I think that people really need to rethink and talk to these nonprofits and set them straight that, you know, who are they really serving? Is it their own self-interest? Or is it really about uh, the community that they're serving? And I'm glad that uh, Dr. McGee and others are part of the CDC because that is the only commission of all the boards of commissions in the city of Austin that looks after the interest of the poor. And if people are not looking after the interest of the poor, they need to get the hell off of that commission. So, um, during the time check here, did you have a brief uh, comment on this? Yes, I, I have. I just wanted to give you one brief comment on it, and that is not everybody who works for a nonprofit is guilty of being a poverty pimp, but unfortunately, enough of them are that they are well loved and, and, and recommended by city staff to the point whenever we have a task force, such as the one that Dr. Tang and I served on, a number of those people will end up being advocates against whatever everybody else is trying to propose that be done. So it is a real problem. I think you should name those. I think that you should name them. I'm asking you to name which nonprofits are you talking about in our town? You should name them. I don't want you dancing around like so and so. So let's keep it real. But yeah, we can keep it real. But we, but if they're not here to defend themselves, and as a journalist, I'm going to just say that I, I've got to probably say um, we need to have another discussion about that around that with those folks present. And I would. He could answer that. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I think that, um, and I think that Dr. McGee and, and uh, uh, Jane both can, Dr. Dr. Rivera, there's too many doctors around me, can do that. But I just really don't want this to become in, uh, uh, kind of digress into a shame kind of session. Let's keep on the topic because because we really haven't gotten to the crux of Code Next and, and, and those issues and what needs to be done there. And I do want to hear from Dr. Rivera and um, also Dr. Tang on some of the solutions that they have. And if we want to hang around later and shout out those organizations, <laughs> we, we can definitely do that done now. So, um, uh, and I, I know some of them myself. I've run into this myself, and um, and I've had some conversations. Believe me, some some uh, be real kind of conversations with some of these organizations. It's Who? Some of these <laughs> some of these nonprofits that are uh, uh, representing or so-called representing and not representing at all, especially over this density bonus issue. So. Um, with that, I wanted to start with uh, Dr. Rivera and move down this slide because I know that everybody had some kinds of solutions. And I really hope that we can um, talk more about Code Next. And we'll get to questions in a minute. We'll take uh, a few comments from uh, Dr. Rivera and then we'll take a few comments from Dr. Tang and then we'll go from there and then a few comments from the audience and try to keep it going that way if we could. Okay. <coughs> Uh, first of all, so that you will get the uh, perspective on code next, some of the things that the mayor's first task force, the one on uh, racial institutionalized racism, said is that we need to make some changes to code next. One is get residents directly in policy-wide to <coughs> prevent or repair the things that are leading to displacement. It's not true. 
and we put in examples from the city of Houston, which happens to be in the same state that we're in, the city of New York, the city of Portland, Oregon, and the city of Denver, where they are addressing exactly the same kinds of problems that we are, so it can be done. Thank you. So we have a question now. I just want to thank Dr. Tang for mentioning something that I've been writing about and talking about for many, many years, reparations. Reparations. The city council has a moral obligation to help displaced families that have been here for generations. It is those families that served and, and, and built this city. Yeah. They deserve reparations. They're the ones that made this a great city. So, you know, there's that, you know, apology is nice, even though it'll probably be hollow, but reparations to make up for the past, to make up for the dark past, the racism that people are not aware of that's been happening in the city for God, many, many, many generations. And my eight generations of my, my family experienced that and displacement. So I really, this is very, very personal for me. I want, you know, for the city to make up for what it's done to my family and others. And can you say your name, please? Anita Quintanay. I grew up on Ray and they cheated us. Craig? Uh, I'll, I'd like you all to comment on this. Uh, two things. One is the biggest lie is that code next and the market will produce low income housing. <laughs> I'm unaware that it's ever done that anywhere in the United States. And the second thing is, why should people believe the proponents of Code Next and the new urbanists and the people behind them when they fought the fund that the Institutional Racism Task Force was trying to create, the $600 million fund, and they fought it bitterly, they fought it at the legislature, and essentially stopped it. And with that, I'd like your comment. Thank you. So we have two uh, questions, and I'd like just to get two. Seconds panelists to answer uh, so that we can get through the line, please. Okay. I want you to take this away from my experience in public housing because new urbanism really began at the same time as the Clinton 1990s. At the time, the argument was, was that public housing projects needed to be destroyed and de-densified. In other words, new urbanists argued the exact opposite for poor and pigmented people in public housing that they are now saying Austin, Texas needs for affordability reasons. It is passive, aggressive, schizophrenic planning behavior at its finest, okay? In the case of poor public housing residents, those places are warehouses where people are being put into high rises like sardines and they're too dense. They must, we must de-densify all costs to the point of kicking them out forcibly, okay? And then at Cabrini Green now, you can have a nice condo for a nice rent of almost $3,000 a month, okay? It, it just doesn't hold up, it's inconsistent, okay? So we'll hear from Susanna, or did you oh, want to comment on that? Okay, so we're gonna to go to the next person, uh, Daniel. Daniel Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, focus on a, on a facet of all of this that uh, hasn't really been talked about right now, and that is the, the, um, the difference between rental and home ownership. And uh, at last count, Austin was at 50% home uh, uh, rental. Uh, by now, it's about 60 or so. And Carmen mentioned Go Valley Johnson Terrace, that's my neighborhood. Uh, we have one project going in that's 320 units. 80% of those units are one bedroom efficiencies starting at $1,500. There's another one on track, just two and a half blocks from there. The point I'm making is, uh, I'll, I'll point to what happened uh, on, on, uh, on Lakeshore between, uh, 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 between Pleasant Valley and, uh, and Riverside. And actually it's like 7,000 apartments, that, that many households. Uh, I think that's uh, not more than eight landowners made that decision, rubbed all those people out. Part of why that happened is because rental and people, concentrations of rental have no political equity. So in my neighborhood, we're pushing for ownership. And I wanna say here that Code Next needs to include ownership of apartments. Because 
houses, individual houses, are difficult to, to buy. But an apartment could be more affordable to people. Anyway, I think that that's one of the things that needs to, to be addressed is we, we need to reverse this trend uh, of, of making the population renters because that's, that goes to uh, the 1% versus the 99%. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Daniel. I need to have your comment. And, and you've um, made a really important point um, about uh, rentals versus home ownership. But I will say that you know when these uh, things, these deals are done, like on the Riverside situation, um, you know the city has not not um, used its muscle because they they wanted a zoning variance and that didn't happen. So well, l l let me just say to to Eric, when you asked why is these uh, these things happening? trustworthy and that's the, I, I share that distrust with uh, the city council and the, and the second thing is that when we make housing that's uh, when we build new housing new housing is the most expensive expensive type of housing there is and and, uh, and so it's hard to make new housing affordable uh, it's the older homes that uh, tend to be more affordable and I'm not suggesting that I'm not suggesting there's a good alternative but I'm, I, I'm a little bit concerned about the idea that new housing is going to be the most affordable housing in this in the city and then secondly when you do affordable housing that's that's based off of income and you say well if you make this certain amount of income then you can then get this type of housing and that type of housing or that type of benefit then becomes a tax because once that income goes up you lose that benefit and even though it's it's a benefit you take that benefit away, it, it effectively is a marginal tax increase. And so you have a lot of people that will say, hey, I don't want to, um, uh, you know, get any more income because I'll lose these these affordable housing benefits. So that those are my concerns about, about that. And, and can we get a brief um, response from Dr. Tang? And then as we go through the line, because we really want to respect the folks in line, can we just maybe have the folks in line direct, and we still have comments, we still have to wrap up with comments. Um, we, we want to just get a quick response from you and everyone else in line, can you direct your questions or comments to one of the panelists so they can answer and we can get through everyone, thank you. So I don't believe that it's just about building new affordable housing, but it's also about sustaining existing affordable housing. So let me be really clear about that. And really the right to stay is kind of the overarching political framework that I would use. And I'm also not skeptical of um, municipal government's ability to manage and, um, and direct affordable housing. I, that's not where I'm coming from at all. I'm not taking an anti-state position. I think some of the models that we talked about in from Portland and Denver and other places are really good models that the city of Boston could implement. And I you know, encourage my friends all the time to to run for city council, I wouldn't do that unless I thought they were trustworthy. I just need to kind of put that out there that um, if like, there has to be an entity that manages affordable housing, a public entity, and um, I should, certainly don't think it should be put in the hands of private entities, right? So, uh, and yeah, there could be some perverse incentive around, you know, um, people like wanting to stay um, in. in in a certain bracket in order to, to maintain affordable housing. But I think those things can be worked out as well. It's not as if someone does well, all of a sudden we're gonna penalize them and you know, the, and people are gonna to try to make below a certain threshold. Um, again, other cities without kind of getting into detail have, have figured this out. And right now the hemorrhaging is so bad when it comes to the affordability crisis that if we don't implement something and begin with increasing the stock, we're really not going to get anywhere. I can't see a solution that doesn't begin with increasing the affordability stock here in Austin. Thank you. So, so we're going to go to Amanda because she has some things, some information to give to everyone right now. So again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, our dynamic and knowledgeable uh, panel up here. Before you leave, and I know we might have time for a few more questions, but before you go, I just want to remind you that if you are interested to get involved, you're already taking the first step, you're here. So we have petitions in the back, we have volunteer sign-up sheets, we have sheets that you can sign up to just be on our list if you want information for upcoming events. There's so many things you can do to get involved. You can 
make a phone call. You can write a letter to your city council. Okay. Because that was what we asked. Um, there is an initiative petition. That means something to put on the ballot. Okay, it takes 20,000 signatures. It just came out today. It is requiring uh, that before Code Next goes into effect, there's a waiting period until after the November 2018 election so that you have a say. And second of all, that you get to vote on Code Next. So if you're interested, you should sign the petition and you should get involved and then I, then you will be assured to have a say. When do Thank we have to right, come right. I was, yeah, and I was going to ask the same thing. So is this a petition for this November? No, should it's it be, May. So it would be May 2018. Correct. So is it available online for sharing and things like that? Yes. It will be. Okay, so it will be available online for sharing, and somebody can give us that online address, and this will be for May 2018. Uh, and the adoption for Code Next right now is slated for April, April. April 2018. So um, this this is really important, really important stuff. Oh boy. So um, this is going to be for Dr. Herrera because I. Um, take exception to the thought that everything is a foregone conclusion. Uh, nothing's a foregone conclusion. Everything's a conclusion after we get it done. So the reality is, what would be the possibility, because I like taking solutions to these, to these ridiculous things that we're doing right now. Uh, what would be the possibility of a small nonprofit buying a piece of the, one of the houses in Terrytown and tearing it down and putting up high density over there for 40% of MI, MFI? Would it be possible that we could buy up a home and show them what density looks like on the west side? Because what I'm hearing is this conversation is about doing something on the east side. You know, everything we're talking about is taking this battle to removing us from the east side. How about we put some, some affordable housing over there? How, what are your feelings about that? I think it would be a great idea. And I think the only opposition that we would have is political. So with that in mind, let me, let me follow that. With that in mind, if, if, if we know what the, the, the pushback would be in Terrytown, if you were to try to tear down a home over in historically white areas that has enough property to put up a massive structure if you like to, they would automatically come back and fight that, right? Oh, yeah. Which will show you exactly what we're doing right now to the east side. And there in lies the lawsuit, and, and, we, and we have something to, to battle. Right now, what we're talking about is, is, is beating a dead horse. Thank you. Well, first of all, as a member of the Land Use Commission, we'll be spending most of my next 90 days focused on the code next. I want to thank you. This has been one of the best sessions I have ever attended. The Land Use <laughs> and let me also say that a lot of my colleagues are here. Fortunately, we didn't do a quarrel, David, but uh, uh, <laughs> we can and, and so, so this, this is good. I mean, these are, I mean, they're not going watch those things. I, I just want to say uh, but two quick things. Uh, one, density bonuses. They are broken. Staff doesn't know it. Uh, I couldn't believe that the housing uh, department uh, said leave uh, uh, Riverside alone. So you're right on track there. We don't have to get into it in more detail. The other is historic. I am always impressed with our two historians on this. Uh, I want to give you three more days. I don't know. Uh, 1952, 1961, uh, and 1984. 1952 was when this city, three to two vote, uh, desegregated uh, uh, West Austin. Uh, and, I, and that's a positive, but I think it's really significant. And I just saw that thinking there, and Ben White was one of the uh, um, three council members which voted for that. 1961, as a young graduate of the, of the University of Texas, I got my first job, and my first assignment was to look at East Austin and uh, as, as a member of the Urban Renewal Forum, right? The very first two projects we did, yeah, he can, he can. the very first two projects we looked at uh, was the upper middle uh, Water Creek and uh, Boggy Creek. Those two were well-intentioned because were for flooded areas. Today they are uh, Waterwood Park and, uh, and, and Rosewood Park. Unfortunately, that was 61. As the 60s moved on, Urban Renewal became a removal and not a relocator. And that's what caused the problem. Last time, 1984, we started some of the first smart growth. I, uh, uh, it was further, I have to, I may be misquoting you, but it unfortunately evolved into what my friend Danielle called, send Mexicans across the river today. 
we don't use <coughs> tools right, and uh, we need to control them. So thank you again, and it's been an honor. I planned on leaving too much foggy earlier, but I couldn't get away. So. <laughs> yes, and even as we speak, there's an all-U.S. open um, to black women. Yeah. Um, uh, before we go to the next question, I did want to say, because I wanted to follow up on the whole issue of the affordable housing, Austin owns thousands and thousands of properties. Yep. And so when people talk about the cost of land, that it would be too expensive to build affordable housing, that's not true. Because we as city uh, people, we own that land. So if the most expensive part is the land, it's there. Austin just doesn't have the ganas to move <laughs> forward to do it. Because I tell you, uh, two years ago I went there, they were going to do a pilot project on four pieces of properties they own to do affordable housing. January they brought the same damn resolution up that they had five properties, only one property had been added and they were going to take another six or nine months for the city manager to see if they could do another pilot project. So that is, that is part of history of how this city council does not move and then has the ability to do affordable housing. Wait, 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 wait. And fifty thousand dollars, but we're renting the properties for eight one thousand eight hundred a month. Now, a lot of people like myself on Social Security, I get four hundred ninety seven dollars a month. So that is very affordable, I told him. He says, Well it's relative, they can get a job. And I said, Well, I do, I work construction, but even then how does a person uh, define affordability when um, the displacement is occurring with Oracle coming in on Riverside and Pleasant Valley, right there by Tin and Ford? Um, they're saying, oh, we have good news, Gloria. We're going to be having apartments for 2500 Are you interested? And I'm going, did you not hear how much I make? <laughs> and so they're saying, well, Understand, I said, no, you have to understand that the average person being on Social Security or being at a job, which $10 an hour makes 40, 40 times 10 is 400 or let's say four weeks, that's 1600 that's 1600 a month. Let's not talk about utilities, food, or let's not talk about toilet paper. And then, let's say, the mixed cultural clusters that are now being created with gentrification. Another one, the schools, where it used to be predominant Latinos where they could get free lunches and free something, some help. Now it's like the white kids are coming in and, I'm sorry, no, I shouldn't use that term. New kids, new, new kids with new incomes are coming in <laughs> and the other ones are going, I'm hungry but we're not getting free lunches because I guess they go by a skill. So my question is, the politics of living quarters and sharing the demographics of affordable housing, and when you give a person a house to live, then they have a chance to say, I'm getting more training, I'm getting a job, I'm sending my kids to school. And it's not just about housing and demographics of affordability. It's about that person having a livelihood. It's not just a building. So, so Gloria, Gloria, you ask a huge question, and there's a lot of dimensions to it. I will, I will be brief. Susanna can speak to the education piece of your question. Um, I think it's important to understand something. When I have conversations with people about tools that could be used to do something about our affordability crisis, I'm often told, and probably many of you in the room are told, well, the state legislature will not allow things such as inclusionary zoning. The state legislature killed linkage fees, and they for sure will not allow rent control. My response has always been, Austin has had rent control since 1939, because our public housing, which is federal housing, is rent control, okay? I mean, people need to get that clear in their head, okay? Rent control means what? Your rent is based upon your income. If you have a $700 a month Social Security check, your rent cannot be, by federal law, more than 30% of your income, okay? 
So we should be building more public housing. Yes. We haven't built any in 37 years in yes. this country. Yes. The Netherlands and Germany, their housing stock, 40% of all housing in those countries is publicly subsidized. In the United States, it's less than 1%. We have an irrational, worshipful thing going on with the private market, a private market that by design is profit-seeking first and human rights and human needs oriented second. Okay. Why would you give money to an organism or an entity that by design is designed to make money and not help you? Okay, thank you. And, uh, yeah, let's go to the next question. Well, we were going to ask about She's, the school. Well, you know, the school also is based on income. So e even if you have a lot of gentrifiers in the school and they can pay full price, you still are able to get um, the free lunch depending on your income. That has not changed. That, that continues to be the, the same. The difference there, if I can just start and chime in super quick, and Susan is absolutely right. I think what we're seeing in a lot of the schools where the population has changed and the populations are dropping is that Title I schools, there's a whole, there's so much funding associated with being a Title I school, which means you have a high rate of free or reduced lunch. At the federal level, it's 50%. If you have 50% or more kids on free or reduced lunch, then you get all, you get Title I funds. Texas actually bumps that up. Mm -hmm. So there are schools with as high as 60% kids on free or reduced lunch that don't get those Title I funds. And so if you reduce the number of, of free or reduced lunch, you're actually losing money for things like after school programs. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Joey, and I volunteer with a group called Save East Austin Schools. And I mean, Code Next and Save East Austin Schools, they converge. They're converging around the same time. But October 23rd to November 7th, the AISD bond, which is over a billion dollars, will be decided on by the voters, and we need lots of volunteers, and I was just wondering, they are only planning on closing uh, and consolidating five schools in East Austin and forcing uh, the kids at Eastside Memorial out of their location um, to move in Lhasa for a super magnet. So I was just wondering uh, what your suggestions are for us as we continue to try to fight this. So this question is directed to whom? to um, people that are into education. <laughs> okay, we, we're just going to have one response because then we have to kind of wrap it up. So, Dr. Chan, thank you. So, you know, one of the clearest indicators of gentrification and displacement is the loss of um, people yeah. under 18 yeah. in neighborhoods, right? I mean, if you want to be able to track where gentrification is happening, uh, you'll, you'll track where there are no more children. And in fact, the largest demographic That's of true the African American population that was displaced between 2000 and 2010 were people under 18. So this is consistent with our findings that people were moving out, not just because of affordability, but because of the, because of, of more attractive educational opportunities elsewhere. So I hope this answers your question directly, but, and I'm gonna try to end by sounding off on a note of optimism. There are people I believe in our municipal government who are taking seriously this question in ways that they haven't before. You know, we do have an office of equity. I don't know. I mean, and we do have, um, you know, I think this, this task force on, on institutional racism is, is a start. If we are able to identify concretely what the affordable housing stock is that is appropriate for families within certain um, catchments and prioritize families moving into them, especially those families that are being displaced, I think we can begin to make a dent in um, the, the under enrollment of some of these campuses. It's gonna take work, it's gonna take people actually looking at what the inventory is and what the rents are and doing a, affirmative marketing to make sure that they go to the families that are most deserving and most in most need of them. Um, I can't, you know, I can't offer more than, than that at this point, that, that there is a housing stock that, that exists, there are, um, ways to get that into the right hands, if you will. And we have to work with city council and the Office of Equity to make sure it happens.